you to the Beer family for uh, their family special item. And, uh, you know, it's not uh, that easy to stand up in front of people and sing. So, children, you were very courageous. Thank you for doing that. And uh, may the Lord give us courage to trust the Lord uh, during impossible challenges. Well, this morning we're going to the book of Exodus. If you'll turn in your Bibles there with me to the book of Exodus, chapter number 16. Exodus chapter number 16. If you were with us last Sunday, we uh, began to look at the importance of the Bible, the importance of the Word of God. And our theme this month is revive my love for thy word, O Lord. Remi revive my love for thy word. And so tonight we're going to look at a very, uh, this morning we're going to look at a very interesting lesson. Um, here in the book of Exodus chapter 16, we're going to look at verses 1 to 4 and then verses 14 and 15. Exodus chapter number 16. I hope you do have a Bible with you. If you don't, feel free to look uh, at the person next to you. I'm sure they'd be happy to share. And let's look at what God says in here in Exodus chapter number 16. Now, speaking of the nation of Israel, it says, And they took their journey from Elam, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came unto the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elam and Sinai, on the fifteenth day of the second month after their departing out of the land of Egypt. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel murmured against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. And the children of Israel said unto them, would to God that we had died by the hand of the Lord of, uh, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots, and when we did eat bread to the full, for ye have brought us forth into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Verse four. Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain rate every day that I may prove them whether they will walk in my law or no. Let's have a look at verses 14 and 15. And when the dew that lay was gone up, behold, upon the face of the wilderness, there lay a small round thing, as small as the hoarfrost on the ground. And when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we look to you now to fill us with your word, to fill us with your truth. We thank you, dear God, for the Old Testament, which has been given to us as an example to encourage our faith. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that you have prepared for us today. And Lord, we pray that as your people, we would be faithful to allow you, Lord, to increase our faith and bring us to obedience in our lives. Lord, we pray that if there is anyone here this morning that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, that this would be the day of their salvation. Lord, we thank you that you, you know all things. You know our hearts. You know our needs. So, Lord, we pray now that you would do your good will and pleasure in our lives as we look into your word. For your glory and the glory of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Well, the nation of Israel were complaining. And that's very obvious to us in verse number three. They had been wandering in the wilderness for little over a month. And it seems like because of their hunger, because of their stomachs, they had forgotten the bitterness of their bondage in Egypt. You remember they had been slaves in Egypt uh, for generations and God had miraculously delivered them 
from their taskmasters, from the Egyptians. In fact, the army of Egypt was destroyed and they would see them no more. And through that miraculous deliverance, they went into the wilderness. And as they journeyed into the wilderness, uh, uh, the Bible tells us, as they headed towards Mount Sinai, they began to crave for food. Now, being hungry is a natural thing. But the problem was that was taking places in, place in their hearts was not a natural thing. They began to doubt God. They began to doubt God's goodness. They began to doubt that God would feed them. And as they complained against Moses, their leader, and against Aaron also, God promised them in his mercy that a wonderful miracle would take place. He would literally rain bread from heaven. Now, the nation of Israel called that bread manna. The word manna means, what is it? They did not know what it was, so that's what they named it. But it was a miraculous gift from God to provide for their everyday needs. Now, keep a bookmark there in Exodus 16. We'll be back. Have a look in the book of John, chapter number 6. The book of John, chapter number 6. John chapter 6, verse 51. Notice what the Lord Jesus Christ said of himself. John chapter number 6. And let's uh, actually begin in verse 48. The Lord Jesus said, I am the bread of life. Your fathers did eat manna in the wilderness and are dead. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven that a man may eat thereof and not die. I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. You see, in the Old Testament, the bread that God rained down from heaven was to sustain their physical life, was to give them food to eat. And here the Lord Jesus Christ said of himself, just like the manna in the wilderness helped them to live physically, the Lord Jesus Christ is the one who can enable us to live eternally. He can give us eternal life. How? Through the giving of his own flesh on the cross when he died for our sins. Now, how can we experience that eternal life? Is it somehow through eating the body of Jesus Christ? Many religions teach that, but they forget what verse 47 says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that, what's the next word? Believeth on me hath everlasting life. To believe on Jesus Christ is to believe that he died for our sins. He rose again from, it, from the dead. And if we repent of our sins and turn by faith and ask him to be our savior, Trusting in his finished work on the cross, the Bible says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Yeah. To call upon him by faith for our salvation is what the Bible describes as believing on him. Yeah. Now, before we go any further this morning, has there been a time in your life that you ate the bread of life? Now, I'm not talking about the communion, the Lord's table, or what religion would call the sacrament of communion. No, I'm talking about Jesus Christ himself. Amen. Has there been a time that you tasted and saw that the Lord was good? Amen. The Bible says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. My friend, we are all sinners, not because I say so, but because God says so. Amen. And the wages of sin is death. What does that mean? Well, death means separation. And my friend, we are all separated from God because we are all sinners. Our sins have separated us from Him. We cannot know Him. We cannot go to Him. No matter how many good things we think we do in life, they cannot undo the sins we have already committed. You see, that is our problem. Romans 3.10 says, There is none righteous, no, not one. But the good news is, God is righteous. He is perfect. He is sinless. Because of His holiness, He must judge us for our sins. 
But because of his love, he came down to this earth. And he came and he was born of a virgin. Jesus Christ lived a sinless, spotless life. And then he went to an old rugged cross. And there on that cross, he shed his blood to pay for your sins and mine in full. That's why the Lord Jesus said, I am that bread of life. You know, bread was the most important food in Bible times. Everyone understood, hey, this is the staple of our day. This is necessary to live. Without bread, we cannot live here in this Bible land. Can you imagine the impact it made when the Lord Jesus said, I am the bread of life. That's why people left him after he said this sermon. Because they rejected him as the savior of their souls. Not because they didn't understand what it meant to eat the bread. No, because they did not want to receive Jesus Christ as their only and personal Savior. They didn't want him as their Lord. They wanted him to defeat the Roman government. But there were some that believed. There are some of you this morning that have believed. There was a time in your life that you realized you were a sinner headed to hell. And you realize that there is a Savior who loved you, who died for you, who rose again from the dead, and He is alive today to forgive you. There are some of you here that have experienced that forgiveness once and for all, and you were a Christian. But perhaps you're here this morning, and you've never tasted that the Lord is good. You know, there are many things in the world that I've never tasted, many different food types, many different uh, dishes, but... There is someone who we must experience eternal life from before we die or else it's too late. The Bible says if we die in our sins, we will be separated from God forever. But if we experience the forgiveness of sins in this life by turning to the Lord as our only Savior, Jesus Christ, we will experience eternal life right now and have life everlasting. This is the bread which cometh down from heaven. Well, in that long introduction, we've seen how Jesus Christ is a picture of the manna in the Old Testament. Uh, The manna in the Old Testament, excuse me, is a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. The bread that came down from heaven. The Lord Jesus Christ gives us eternal life. And if you're not sure where you're going to go when you die, if you died right now, let me encourage you, don't leave the church this morning. Don't leave this place before making sure you have received him as your personal savior. Come and talk to us, please, before you go. We'd love to show you from the Bible what it means to receive Christ as your personal savior. Well, we see the picture of of, uh, Christ in the manner. But notice in the book of Deuteronomy, there is another lesson in this Old Testament book, the book of Deuteronomy. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and then Deuteronomy, chapter number 8. Notice something else about the manna in the wilderness. Here in Deuteronomy, chapter 8, and verse 3. The Bible says, And he humbled thee, looking back on the wilderness journey, And he humbled thee and suffered thee to hunger and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, neither did thy fathers know. What was the purpose of God sending manna to the people of God? That he might make thee know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of the Lord doth man live. You see, manna was a picture of the Lord Jesus Christ. But manna was also a spiritual lesson to the nation of Israel to how they were to trust in God. God not only provided for their physical needs, but God was teaching them that the nation of Israel needed to rely on God for their every need. In fact, it was the word of God that they needed. And by God's word, he sent manna. And by God's word, they would live. So it was a spiritual lesson. And there are some spiritual lessons that we are going to learn this morning about the manna of the word of God. Back in Exodus chapter 16, 
we're going to see some lessons for ourselves this morning about how the manner that God gave Israel in the wilderness was meant to teach them to rely on his word, to rely on the word of God. As God's people, food sustains us physically, but the word of God is what only will sustain us spiritually. What can we learn about the manner of the word of God as we get straight into it this morning? Well, notice verse number four. Where did it come from? Then said the Lord unto Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. Now, this is an unbelievable miracle. Imagine after God said this, the next day the Jews woke up and they peered out of their tents in the early morning and saw nothing but an absolute miracle covering the ground around them. They had never seen anything like it. There were probably at least over two million tiny little, as verse 14 told us, small round things on the ground. They were like a hoarfrost, which means a flat substance, almost like the snow on the ground. But they weren't in the, in the snowy mountains in that day. They were in the wilderness, remember? Yes, it would get cold. Now, if we woke up this morning and we saw frost on the ground, would we be surprised? No, definitely not. Not in Canberra, not in Queanbeyan. You know, we would think it's so cold that there should be frost on the ground. There should be frost on the windows of our car. But this was an absolute astounding wonder of God. As every morning they would come out and marvel at this bread that God had sent down from heaven. What a miracle. What a wonder. As we think about the lessons from the manna in the wilderness and how it was meant to teach them about the word of God, we realize something special about the Bible this morning, don't we? My friend, the word of God that we hold in our hands is nothing less than an absolute miracle from God himself. This is his word sent down from heaven above. That's the first lesson. The word of God is given to us by God himself. Second Peter chapter number two. If you'll turn with me there for a moment, let's have a look at second Peter. Excuse me, verse number one. The book of second Peter, verse number one and verse twenty one. Second Peter chapter 1 and verse 21. Notice what the Bible says about the Bible. Second Peter chapter number 1 and verse 21. For the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. You see, the Bible is very clear on where the Bible came from. God tells us himself in his own word that the prophecies, the declarations of the word of God came not in old time by the will of man. In other words, they were not made up by men and man did not invent the Bible. God used men to write the Bible, but the author is not man. God is the only author of the Bible. Holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit of God moved the writers to record the very inerrant, perfect word of God. It was a supernatural miracle that God used men to write exactly what God had intended. My friend, this Bible is a miracle, miracle of God. Nothing less than an awesome, God-given, divine revelation. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16 says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. Is every word in the Bible the word of God? I know many people who think some words are in, in the Bible are God's word, but others aren't. Hang on a second, how can you tell which is which? Probably the ones I don't want to obey is not God's word. Isn't that right? I don't like the idea of sin, but I like the idea of a savior that loves me 
and a saviour that wants the best for me. I don't really like the idea that I'm a sinner headed to hell, so I'm just going to love a Jesus that suits my needs. My friend, that's not the Jesus of the Bible. The Bible says that Jesus said, I am come to seek and to save that which is lost. And we are lost sinners in need of a saviour. But once we are saved, the Bible tells us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. Every word in the word of God is divinely preserved. That's why the Bible says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. The word of God. Isn't it amazing how God loves us? As we think about the manna in the wilderness, it's unbelievable how, how much the Israelites complained, how much they, they blamed God for delivering them from the slavery of Egypt. They so quickly forgot what it was like to be in bondage. And that's the sinful nature we have. But God is merciful. He gave them manna from heaven. And likewise, God has given us the most precious gift, the most amazing miracle as believers, his own very word. But so often that's not how we see it, do we? You see, we see the Bible is just like another book on the shelf. And we pull it out when we want to or we feel like it. But that's not what it is, my friends. How do you approach the Word of God? Do you approach God's Word each day, remembering that this book is a miraculous gift of God? Do you realize His love in giving you His Word, giving you the bread from heaven to sustain you spiritually? Is that how you and I look at the Bible? Well, so often we don't, and that's why we need to revive our love for the Word of God. Amen? Christian, this book is a miracle. What a precious gift of God. Every morning the manna was there, and every morning the Word of God is there for us. Isn't that true? And God is waiting for you and I to enjoy His food from heaven, the spiritual food that He desires to fill us with is is a miraculous and supernatural work of God. The manna came down from heaven. Now, that's a, very, that's a very obvious lesson for us this morning. And let's be excited about the word of God as we continue. Exodus chapter 16. Notice verse number 15. As we turn back to the book of Exodus, notice another lesson from the manna here in Exodus 16. The Bible says in verse number 15, and when the children of Israel saw it, they said one to another, It is manna, for they wist not what it was. And Moses said unto them, This is the bread which the Lord hath given you to eat. So they did not know what it was. So they used this word manna, which means what is it? What is it? They did not know what it was, but Moses told them what it was. This is the bread which God has given you to eat. Not only was it a gift from heaven, a gift from God, but it was their necessary food. Would you agree with that? This is what they needed to eat. They could not get it from anywhere else. And hang on a second, they couldn't get it from anyone else. They could only get it from God. They could not make it for themselves. And there was nothing else that they could find in the wilderness. That's why they were complaining, but God provided the solution, didn't he? The manna from heaven. And God's lesson to these Israelites was that they must depend on him for their every single need. Why? That he might make them know that man doth not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of of the mouth of the Lord. Manna was their necessary food. And this morning we need to realize that the word of God is our necessary food. Christian, you and I cannot live without the word of God. We cannot live without this book. God has given us a miracle from heaven, but we need to remember that we cannot do without it. First Peter chapter number two uh, and verse 2 says, As newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, 
that ye may, say it, grow thereby. Once a sinner repents of their sins and receives the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior, they become a born-again child of God. But that's just the start of growing in Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us one of the signs that you've been born again, one of the indications, the evidences that you are a true Christian is that you have a hunger, a new desire for what God wants for you. And you have a disgust for what was sending you to hell the sins of the past. But you have a new desire for what God desires us to have. And what is one of those desires? A hunger for the Word of God. Just like a newborn baby uh, will uh, make it known when they're hungry. And there's no question about what they want when they cry and they scream. Mothers know what they need because they make it known. They desire the milk that they need to grow. And as a Christian, God gives us a hunger for his word because God knows that his word is necessary for our lives. We cannot do without his word. We ought to have a hunger for the word of God because it is our necessary food. Why is it that we go cold as Christians? Why is it that we stop being excited about the things of God? Why is it that we feel like that we are just lean spiritually? Well, I'm sure you've guessed the answer by now. It's because we've stopped feeding on the Word of God. Christian, the nation of Israel had a choice. Moses said, Israel, this is the bread that God has given you from heaven. You need to take and eat of it. If you don't eat of it, you're going to suffer the consequences. Likewise, as Christians, as we journey through the wilderness, we can become so easily discouraged. When all we see in the valleys of life is death, we can become discouraged. We can become filled with fear. We can become uh, complaining Christians and lose sight of the goodnesses of God and lose sight of who God is and what he has done in our lives and what his plan is for the future. You and I can be so much like the nation of Israel. And what is the solution? Well, man, man shall not eat by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God shall man live. The word of God is our necessary food. That's something we need to remember if we will see revival in our lives for a love of his word. If we're starving spiritually, it's because we haven't been spending time in the word of God. We need his word. Have a look in John, Job chapter number 23. Here is a wonderful verse, very appropriate to our subject this morning. Job chapter number 23. Now, just before the book of Psalms, you'll find the book of Job. Job chapter 23 and verse 12. Why don't we read verse 12 together? Job chapter 23 and verse 12. Job said, neither have I, excuse me, let's read it together. Job chapter 23 and verse 12 on two, one, two. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Christian, is that how you view the word of God? More necessary than your everyday food. More necessary than every other need. Do you hunger for the word of God? Why do we become lean spiritually? Why do we need revival? Because we forget what God has given us. It's a gift from heaven and it is so necessary for us. His precious, divine, supernatural word. Listen, if you, you and I cannot do without food, how much more can we not do without the manna from heaven which God hath given us to eat? You see, it is our necessary food. And Christian, we have a choice either to feed on his word or to suffer and stagger and stumble spiritually. What a reminder this morning of the importance of the word of God, the manna from heaven, 
the necessary food. And in Exodus chapter 16, we see that the manna satisfied their hunger. As we turn back, notice that the manna was just not just necessary for their appetite, but it was actually satisfying. They enjoyed it. It was created to be enjoyed. Exodus chapter 16 and verse number 31. Exodus chapter 16. Notice verse number 31 of the description of this bread of heaven. And the house of Israel called the name thereof manna. What was it like? And it was like coriander seed, white. And the taste of it was like wafers made with honey. Notice, first of all, it was satisfying. The manna satisfied their hunger. Uh, and it was especially nutritious. Think for a moment that this meal that they had in the morning, the nation of Israel, had to be enough and nutritious enough to sustain them for an entire day's journey in the wilderness. I mean, I don't think it's an understatement to say that this was God's heavenly superfood for the nation of Israel. Imagine the nutrients and the vitamins it contained. That was enough for them to satisfy their hunger, but also to satisfy their taste. The Bible says that it was pleasant. The taste of it was like wafers made with honey. And when our children read these verses, they go, yum, that sounds delicious. And I often tease my wife, here's the biblical principle for having a sweet breakfast in the morning. <laughs> you know, Asians don't usually eat sweet breakfast in the morning. And they like savory food, and maybe that's how you grow up. So I like to tease her a little bit. But the food was delicious. The manna was delicious. It was sweet to the taste, like wafers of honey. You know, God gave the necessary food that they needed, but it was also meant to be enjoyable. It satisfied their hunger. It was just what they needed to keep them physically strong for the day and to enjoy the first meal of the day. What about the Word of God? What lesson do we learn from the manna in the wilderness? Psalm 119. Notice Psalm 119. This wonderful psalm, as we mentioned last week, teaches us, teaches us about the importance of God's Word. The importance of God's Word. Psalm 119. Verse 103, please. David said, How sweet are thy words unto my taste. Yea, sweeter than honey to my mouth. Do you see that this morning? David the psalmist esteemed God's word much better than anything he'd ever eaten. Much better than any earthly pleasure he'd ever enjoyed. He saw and knew that the word of God was the greatest need of his soul that satisfied his every spiritual hunger. Christian, let us be reminded this morning that nothing can satisfy us other than our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. He is the living word. And we have the word of God. And Christian, you and I will not go very far at all if we don't believe that God's word will satisfy every need of our souls. Yes, it will. Yes, it will. When we're afraid, the word of God will comfort us. Why? Because God gives us certain promises when we are afraid. When we are afraid. The Bible says, uh, be careful for nothing. Don't be worried and overly afraid. No matter where you find yourself in this word, world, be careful for nothing. But by everything... By prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. What a wonderful promise and a reminder that God hears our prayers in our darkest hours. God hears our prayers when we have the deepest need. He hasn't gone anywhere. And God, in fact, promises us a peace that passeth all understanding. A peace that passeth all understanding shall fill our hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. But if we're not spending time in the Word of God, we won't know the promises of God. We won't be satisfied in our Christian life because we will always lean on our own understanding. That's the danger. But when we come to the Word of God, let's be reminded that it's satisfied our every need. The Word of God will protect us from sin. 
The Bible has wonderful truths to protect us from the, from the dangerous paths of life. Isn't that right? The whole book of Proverbs, if you will just turn to a proverb, you'll find some wisdom for the day to help you to escape the snare of temptation, the snare of foolishness, the snare of the, the strange woman and the wicked man. Satisfying for our every need. God meets us at our every need, but he does so through his divine word. The man is satisfied their hunger and God's word satisfies the soul. Listen to what the Lord said in Psalm 81 and verse 10. He said, I am the Lord thy God, which brought thee out of the land of Egypt. Open thy mouth wide and I will fill it. God's desire for us is that we would simply open our mouth wide. We, put, we would open our hearts to receive his word. My friend, do you hunger for more in your Christian life? Do you hunger for revival? Well, revival will never happen outside a new love and devotion to the word of God. We need to come back to his word. It's so important. The miracle from heaven the necessary food and the satisfying food for our soul. Christian, are you dissatisfied with what's happening in your life? Are you complaining? Are you murmuring? Are you wondering if God is even there? Well, you're in the place you're in. It's because you're, it, because you're not listening to what he said in his word. I will never leave you nor forsake you, saith the Lord. I will be with you always, saith the Lord. Every promise is a truth we can claim for our lives, for the personal revival of that day, for our every need. Well, that is what God has given us in his word. Satisfying, fulfilling. God speaks to us personally through his word. God gave his word to all mankind. But the Bible teaches us at the moment of salvation, the Holy Spirit of God comes to dwell within us. Isn't that right? And he will lead us into all truth. He is our personal teacher so that we need no man to teach us. Isn't that interesting? That God speaks to us personally in his word each day knowing the needs of our lives, knowing the needs of the hour and he's able to comfort rebuke he's able to bring us to repentance he's able to bring us to hope he's able to bring us to a point of joy even in the midst of sorrow why because we have the holy spirit of god within us that takes the word of god and then does a work in our hearts according to our deepest needs the reason why we struggle is because we skip a meal don't we and then we skip another meal. And then we go so long as we wonder what went wrong. Well, we need to go back to the manner. Amen. The manner of the word of God that God has given us and hunger after his heavenly food. As we think about the word of God this morning, we've seen a few interesting truths now we're going to get a little bit more practical. Notice in chapter 16 of the book of Exodus, Exodus chapter 16 and verse 19. Here were some instructions about what Israel had to do with this miracle from heaven. And Moses said in verse number 19 of chapter 16, let no man leave of it till the morning. In other words, when you see it on the ground, collect it quickly. Don't just leave it there. That's not going to work. Have a look in verse 20. Notwithstanding, they hearken not unto Moses, but some of them left of it until the morning, and it bred worms and stank, and Moses was wroth with, wroth with them. In other words, uh, they did not obey what Moses said. They just left it there. They thought, hey, I'll leave it to later in the day to collect. And the Bible says that the manna went off. 
It soured, it smelled, it bred worms, and it had to be thrown away. It was no good any longer. What was the lesson? They needed fresh manna in the morning for every new day. They had to gather it in the morning. The manna had to be eaten daily. And Christian, before we go on to some other practical lessons, we need to feed on God's word every single day day every single day that man shall not live by bread alone but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God if you and I wake up with the gift of life each day that should be a reminder that in order to live we need the word of God that's what we need we need his daily bread I'm glad you're in church on Sunday it's the best place to be amen the most important place to be It's where we ought to leave full of the Word of God. But imagine if you only ate twice a week. And and children, you can even work out this question. How would you feel if you only ate twice a week? I wonder how mum and dad would feel after hearing all your grumbling, all your complaining. We'd feel pretty hungry, wouldn't we? In fact, we would feel absolutely weak, famished, undernourished, fainting, Isn't that right? You can think of the rest of the words. If we did not eat daily, we would be in trouble. Now, there are times and seasons of fasting, I do understand. But the principle we find here is that Israel had to eat every day. The manna could not be stored up. It could not be collected. It had to be eaten freshly when it was available. And you and I need fresh manna each day from the word of God if we want to be healthy Christians. Christian, do you have a plan each day to feed on God's word? Is there a time that you have, that you have set aside to hear from God Almighty himself? How many of you agree this morning that God speaking to you makes all the difference in your daily life? How many of you agree with that? Absolutely. The God who made us, the God who saved us, desiring for you and I to spend time with him. He speaks to us in his word. We speak back to him in prayer. A relationship with God isn't a dream in the middle of the night. No, the relationship with God is right here in the holy word of God. And if you've never experienced it before, it may be because you are not yet saved. I didn't understand this book before I was a Christian. In fact, every time I read it, I closed it because I was afraid. I knew I was a sinner and I didn't want to go to hell. But I missed out on the wonderful truth that Jesus Christ died for my sins. And I thank God someone shared that with me one day. And then when I received Jesus Christ as Savior, this book, which was already alive, began to speak to me. I began to understand what I could never understand before. Listen, if you can't understand the word of God and it makes no sense and and, uh, you just don't get it, then perhaps, first of all, you need to understand John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And once you have everlasting life, the words of your heavenly Father will speak to you will change your life. And we need to eat daily from the manna from heaven. Every day. We all get busy. We all have priorities. You know, I think about the nation of Israel in the wilderness and what it was like to to camp in tents, journeying from one place to another. Hey, that is not an easy job. You know, for the husbands and the fathers, they had to look after their families. Um, To say they had responsibilities would have been an understatement. They had to look after their flocks. They had to look after their their herds. The wives and the mothers had to look after their, their children. At a certain time, when the trumpet was blown, by the way, when the trumpet was blown, they had to pack up all their belongings and make sure they filed in rank with their specific tribes and march through the wilderness to the next location. Now, if that happened, before they ate, they were in big trouble because they would march on through the rest of the day without their necessary food. They would have missed out. 
And imagine what that day would have been like if they didn't eat from it. Well, there is a lesson for you and I. Because so often we go through the day without the joy, without the hope, without the fullness of the Spirit of God. Why? Because we've missed out on the Word of God that day. We've left it until it's too late. What do I mean? Well, God's Word always speaks to us. But isn't it true when the sun comes up and the day begins, the busyness of the day takes over? Isn't that right? The day gets underway. So not only do we need to feed on God's Word daily, but here is a principle. We need to feed on God's Word early. To feed on God's Word early. That is just a principle in the Word of God. If we're going to spend time with the Word of God, there is wisdom in spending time with God in the morning. And young singles, if you haven't worked that out by now, when you get married and have kids, you will quickly work that out. Because once they get up, it is too late to have a quiet time. Some of you parents know what I mean, and you're laughing. Once they wake up, and they're small, let me say that. Um, I will say this, just to make sure no one's confused. Every life stage has a different season. We understand that. When I was a single young adult, sometimes um, my favorite time in my quiet time was in the evening where I could spend more time in God's Word than I could in the morning, though the time in the morning was shorter. When you get married, there's a change. When you have kids, there's a change. When you get older and your kids start to grow up, there's a change too. And they start to have their own quiet times. There are different seasons in life. But there is wisdom, I hope you see it this morning, in gathering the manna from heaven early. Before the heat of the day, begins. What does that mean? Before work starts. Isn't that right? Before our duties begin. Before the phone starts ringing. You know, airplane mode is a wonderful mode on our mobile phones. You know what that does? It puts our phones back to the dark ages. That's what it does. Do you remember when you could take your phone off the hook? Do you remember those days? Um, my parents grew up in those days. And uh, you, had a, you had a phone on the wall, you could take it off the hook. And that way you could have a quiet time without being disturbed. And the moment you put it back on the hook, you were ready for the incoming calls. And the, and the airplane phone, uh, mode is a wonderful mode, which switches off all incoming news calls until you've had your quiet time with God. Rather than waking up before you even get started to the whole world knocking on your doorstep, knocking on your door to enter in. Church family, let me encourage you to gather the manna from God early. To start the day with the Lord. To gather spiritual food from God. We need His Word. We need His Word to endure the day. We need food for our souls. And we need strength for the day ahead. Let me encourage you to develop a habit of spending time with God before the duties of the day begin. Chapter 16 and verse 21 says, um, chapter 16 and verse 21, And they gathered it every morning, every man according to his eating, and when the sun waxed hot, it melted. Now, the Bible will never melt, and it will never sour, it will never go off. That is not the application. But the obvious application is, don't wait until it's too late. Don't wait until you get too busy to spend time in His Word. Oftentimes in the evening, we become too tired to spend time in His Word. So wisdom in the Word of God says spend time with Him early. Verse 21 says they gathered it every morning. That word gathered tells us that it took some work to collect the manna. I don't know what you like to do first thing in the morning, especially when it's cold. It's hard to get out of bed, but they had to go, didn't they? It was go, go, go time. They had, to gather the work. they had to gather the manna every morning. It took effort, but it was worth it. And for you and I, it, it will also take effort. It will also take effort to set a time. And the challenge will be present every day, won't it? Um, it's so easy to sleep in. It's so easy to, to press the snooze button. And we forget how important our 
time with God in His Word is. And when we miss out on our quiet times in the morning, the rest of the day does. There are consequences for the rest of the day. Now, we will miss out. There will be days that we will, we will miss our quiet times. There will be things that will come up that are unintended or perhaps intentional. But let the lesson for today be, let's make a determined effort to daily feed from the Word of God, to make a time, to put in the effort that's needed. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Make sure your body, your flesh, doesn't become your dictator. Make sure we're ready for the day ahead. If the nation of Israel marched into the wilderness without their necessary food, they would have been languishing. I know if I was in that camp, I would have learnt my lesson after a few days. And God was teaching them that lesson. He was teaching them to depend on the word of God, to obey him, to believe his word, to trust in his heavenly provisions. He is the one that sustains them. And may God help us to learn the lessons of each day. Did I get from God what he wanted me to get today? Did I take my fill? Or was it just a quick snack? Again, there are times that, well, it just didn't start off well, the day. And, you know, that day's over. Let's not live in the days of the past. Amen. Let's not just become so discouraged and say, well, I'm not going to, uh, I can't be a Christian. I can't grow because I just can't, I can't get around this, this, this practice of having a quiet time. Oh, may God give us the grace to spend some day, some time in the day with his word. Sometimes, mothers, it's after the children have gone to school or sometimes after school is over that you, you're able to sit down and have a quiet moment. God knows that. But are we feeding on the word of God? Are we spending time in his word? I'd like to close with Exodus chapter 16 and verse 35. Exodus chapter 16 and verse 35. And the children of Israel did eat manna 40 years until they came to a land inhabited. And they, did, and they did eat manna until they came unto the borders of the land of Canaan. The manna from heaven was given to the nation of Israel for 40 years. God never forgot them all those years. God always supplied for their needs. God gave them an abundant supply. Here's a question. If they ever were starving, if they ever were weak physically, whose fault would it have been? Could they truly have blamed God for not having anything to eat, yes or no? No. It would have been their fault for not taking their fill, for not obeying the word of God for not going out and collecting the bread from heaven that God freshly rained down every day. It was a gift from heaven. It was their necessary food. It was satisfying for their every need. They could collect it daily and they needed to. And they needed to gather it early for their daily needs. And lastly, the manna had no limit to its supply. It had no limit to its supply. For 40 years, they gathered manna in the wilderness. I heard of a story about a granddaughter and a grandmother and the granddaughter was watching her grandmother read the Bible each day and observing this habit for several years. Her granddaughter said, aren't you ever going to get finished reading that book? And the grandmother said, no, there is no limit to the word of God. There is fresh manner in the word of God every single day. This is not just any ordinary book. I hope you've seen that this morning. This is God's heavenly food for us. It never runs dry. It never gets old. We never read through the Bible once and say, well, I've learned everything. No, the miraculous truth is, as we submit to God in different areas of our lives and God leads us into obedience in different places that he brings us to, 
God begins to speak in those areas in ways that we have never understood. In, in actual fact, He unlocks truth in the Scripture as we submit to Him and we obey the Word of God. Some things we are blinded to because we haven't been dealing with our sins. Some things that we, we have hesitated to because we haven't, we haven't stepped forward by faith. But isn't it amazing, Christian, and you can say amen, as we step forward in, in faith, God illuminates us to the Word of God and to His truth. It's unbelievable. But He calls us to obey first. He calls us to open up the Word of God first to submit ourselves to His Word, and His Word will become fresh. He'll, it will become new. And then we begin to study the Word of God. And we dig beneath the surface and we, we, we start to, to, to get below the flecks of gold, down to the great nuggets that are buried below, and enjoy the richness of His Word. That is the, one of the greatest adventures of the Christian life. Hearing the Word of God, God Himself speak to us, in ways that we did not before understand or could not perhaps yet receive. Christian, the manna has no limits, limit to its supply. So why do we stop reading the Bible? Well, may God help us to feed from the Word of God each day. I have esteemed the words of His mouth more than my necessary food. Christian, did you eat today? Did you read the Word of God today? May He help us this week. May that be your prayer as we close. Lord, revive my love for Thy Word. May God remind us of the importance of the Word of God. May we value His Word. May we, may we treasure His Word. And when we open it, may we be receptive to his word. If we read the Bible like a textbook because we have to, it will be dry. It will be cold because we've lost sight of what his word is. But if we imagine ourselves like those Israelites peering through the tent in the early hours of the morning, about to behold the greatest miracle that God had given them, the bread from heaven, I dare say our quiet times will be a little bit different. Amen? Our heart attitude would be receptive to his word and he will give us the food to sustain us for our spiritual lives each day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these helpful lessons this morning. Lord, forgive us for treating your word as just another thing to do or just another book we have or just another chore to complete. Lord, forgive us for our unbelief. Lord, we look to you to teach us that your word is our necessary food. And please do a work in our hearts this morning. Help us to make some decisions to... Spend time with you each day. And Lord, only you can do that, that work of grace in our lives. Help us to be yielded this morning to your will. As every head is